you take pictures of the screen. Ava can go ahead and get it shared now, your screen, all of your slides now. Beautiful. Well, I'll go ahead uh, with the introduction, Dr. Sinnott, if you're okay. Yes, please. Absolutely. Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Department of Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. We could not be starting the new calendar year in any finer fashion. Uh, this calendar year marks our 50th anniversary as a Department of Internal Medicine. And we could, as I stated, not have a more perfect talk or a more perfect speaker. Our chairman, Dr. John Sinnott, will be presenting today. Dr. Sinnott is the James Cullison Professor of Medicine as chair of our department, our department and has recently That's begun his 10th year in this position after succeeding Alan Goldman on December 1st, 2012. He is only the third chair in the 50 year history of this department, which is a feat that one will be hard pressed to find at any other academic center. Among the many accomplishments of Dr. Sinnott, which would take 50 minutes to rattle off, uh, are the naming of the USF's College Faculty Teacher of the Year Award in his name for the last 30 years, uh, which is quite a run, and as well as receiving the American College, Physicians, American College of Physicians Laureate designation six years ago, the highest award that the ACP can give. Dr. Sinnott is an outstanding speaker, we, and he often engages his audience in his talks, so let this be a warning for everybody to be on their toes and ready to respond. But we are in for a treat as we hear John give us the state of the department in the 50th year of the department, as mentioned, and his 10th year as chair. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. John Sinnott. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Lazama. As you can tell, uh, I pay Dr. Lazama, Lazama a lot of money to say nice things. Uh, I want to begin by greeting my colleagues, distinguished guests, and other members of the department. We have a lot going on. We have a look at the past a look at the present, and in the talk, I'm going to give you a look at the future. None of this that I'm showing you could have been done without the support of vice chairs, and I'm truly blessed to work with these people. Doctors Kim, Krischer, Lazama, and Alexner are a team that are as high as quality as any in the nation. That I guarantee you. Our, our 50th anniversary, I want to report that our academics are thriving at, even as we defy an implacable pandemic whose ending is quite unclear, but very much depending on what we do. We're here to review the state of the department, to reinforce our missions, the core missions, clinical care, education, research. We're also here to move into the realm of being architects of the post-COVID medical world. If you thought 9-11 changed the world, COVID is going to change it much more. The traditional model of Abraham Flexner in 1914 was a three-legged stool of teaching, research, and patient patient. And you needed that, uh, and we certainly still need it, in order to produce the best doctors we can. We work with wonderful material, students so gifted I'm astonished when I talk to them, but I can tell you one thing, I'm not astonished when I learn from them. 
because I learn from trainees and faculty members every day. It truly makes my life worthwhile. I wanted to embody what we're doing now. This is what we're doing now. We're building the department while we fly it. We're doing exotic procedures. It took a cardiolo cardiologist 30 minutes the other day to explain to my primitive brain really what he did, why it was so creative, and when I finally understood, I realized that this man had created new knowledge, that many lives would be saved because of what he had thought of in a new way of thinking and applied it to a new situation. And that's repeated every day in every division. If we look at the future, um, <laughs> if we look at the past, we find a somewhat fractured past, not through any specific fault of people, more through the idea of growing pains as a new medical the school decides what it's going to be. I think things finally came to fruition under the vision of Dr. Lockwood. I had initially not really understood well where he was headed, but he turned out to be much more of a futurist than I would ever have imagined. I thought I had ideas about the future, but he saw the future and he knew what we had to do. And he has helped us at every step of the way. And we need to take a second to thank him for his efforts. Under his leadership, our department has been able to thrive like never before. The future of medicine is in new knowledge. The future of doctoring is in new approaches to humanity, to understanding the idea of syndemic medicine, that medicine takes place in a society. We need to understand that our social contract with society is rapidly changing as business tries to make medicine a commodity, something that I think we should fight against. I'm not sure how, but COVID certainly helping. Next slide. These are our new clinical and research faculty. Um, I want you to take a good look at them. Uh, my greatest problem, other than being old and having no memory, is that everyone is wearing masks these days. So I greet everyone as doctor, thank them for what they do, and then try to figure out who I talk to. But this is what they look like without masks. You see tremendous diversity. Diversity, not just of ethnic or racial, but you see diversity of thought. People that bring different ideas, people that bring ideas about 3D printed nasal swabs, people that bring ideas about new types of antibody infusion, people that take interventional pulmonary to new levels. Each person here is added to our mission. Each person is a vital member of the team. We have new leadership. We have Dr. Kami Kim as vice chair of clinical research. Uh, this position, and we were trying to figure out how to manage it for a year and a half. And then in, we started looking at the past year, and we found that Dr. Kim had conducted somewhere between 60 and 80 studies on COVID. It might be more. Uh, and it's obvious that this is the individual to lead us as vice chair of clinical research. This is a new appointment. I'm extraordinarily proud of Dr. Kim. I'm honored to know her. You will hear much more of her in the future. Amanda Wilson Morris 
the Division Director of Hospice and Palliative Care, is one of the kindest, most thoughtful individuals I've ever talked with. What a, a gentle person and how important she is to have along for a transition that sooner or later all of us will be making. But she's there to help us help our patients. I want to welcome Dr. Gatain Michaud. Gatain has come in to a, an extraordinarily difficult situation and is bringing order to it. She's done so with style and affability. I am proud to know her. I find myself seeking her advice more and more frequently. And it's great to have both a clinician and a scientist there. I want to talk for a moment about uh, Guillermo Oliveira. He says, call me Go. And I said, why? He said, I'm going places. And he's right about that. I can't figure out how many cardiologists now are involved with Go, Geo. I do know where they're going now. They're going in the direction of quality. They're conducting beautiful research. We have our Heart Institute, and we have a clinical arm that's delivering the quality that our social contract with society demands. It's important. Cardiology has languished for years. Now it's leading the charge. Thank you, Gio. Keep up the good work. He somehow managed to merge among the first, a Tampa General and USF group. For that, I think there's some kind of Medal of Honor. I'm still checking on it. I'd like to welcome Dr. Camille Thalen as Program Director of Gastroenterology. This program is ranked 26 out of 5,800 programs in the country, 5,800 hospitals. They have brought excellence to clinical practice and teaching and have built an outstanding team. Dr. Carrie Ann Van Nostrand, I think uh, one of several right hands of Dr. Michaud, has taken the fellowship in pulmonary and actually given it depth and meaning. Dr. Lopez Toval in nephrology, again, has taken a fellowship, put it in first class order, and now has a group of enthusiastic learned nephrologists that are always, one, a pleasure to work with, true ladies and gentlemen, and also wonderful with patients. I have never called on his group that I haven't learned something new. I also want to welcome Dr. Harold Paul as Assistant Program Director for General Medicine and also Dr. Jeff Cummings. Together, they bring new vitality to the Department Division of General Medicine. These are some of the great, if you would call it, jewels of the kingdom. These are grant-funded research faculty. Um, it's very hard to get pictures of them, so not all are pictured. I asked uh, Dr. Christian Brichot, the globally famous virologist from the Pasteur Institute with a pedigree I can't even describe, who also is a frequent mentor, how he figured out who was who in the faculty. And he told me that, John, it's just like France. You can tell the full-time faculty from the part-time faculty because the full-time faculty are never here. They're always off doing something. The part-time faculty are here helping with the work. And he was certainly right about that. Dr. White has done, made great strides in, great strides in eukaryotic pathology. And Dr. Charad Sambunwit is a state leader in innovative HIV care and with numerous NIH subgrants and study groups 
she leads the way in HIV care. Tom McDonald in cardiology. Each person here is a truly respected scientist anywhere in the world. And a special thanks to Dr. Miao and Dr. Shui for the work they've done with malaria. As you know, I have a soft spot in my heart for malaria, having worked in some parts of the world where it was common for children to die of malaria. And it's been one of my dreams to do something about it. We have multi-investigator teams. We have a translational team in allergy and immunology, a translational team in pulmonary and critical care medicine, a translational research team in infectious disease, and we're working on one in rheumatology. Additionally, we have existing Dr. Sambunwood's comprehensive care, the USF Institute for Microbiomes, the Infectious Disease Research Unit, and the Eukaryotic Pathogens Program, all of which form a very unique grouping at a time when pandemics are truly an existential threat. In infectious disease research, these are the individuals involved, but I'm most impressed by growth in the bottom two lines. We have eight postdocs and six research associates. The department is truly growing into a powerhouse. When I was selected to be chair in 2013, the dean's assessment was that our faculty had substantial clinical strength, but not a lot of local recognition. Our educational programs were not optimally organized and research product was low. I asked him if he had any advice. He said, yes, John, I want you to change the culture. So that has been what I have been working on for the past decade. Next slide. This is one of the fruits of what we've been working on. This is obviously the su success story of Dean Lockwood and President John Corus. The idea that we're now joining 120 other United States academic medical centers. You can read here the obvious advantages. We essentially double our patient base. We increase purchasing power. We have opportunities to increase graduate medical education. If you look at the bottom, this is our new logo. And it's our aspiration to see this through and make it the most successful academic medical center in the country. I'm always asked about money. Um, how does it come in? Where does it go, et cetera? If you want granular detail, Jessica Burgess can give you granular detail. This is more of the way I see it. The large green bar on this side over here shows us that we bring in a lot of clinical money. What do we do with it? It's used to subsidize research. You know, you can't get grants without pre-grant research. That has to be funded by us. It goes for improving teaching. It goes for community service efforts that look at the current syndemic, the idea that the social determinants of health are every bit as important as genetic determinants of health. Finally, we managed to put all this together and function as a wonderful team. I want to thank each of you because every one of you contributes to this important schematic. What have we built? We've built a residency of about 
140 plus internal medicine residents. We have 125 plus fellows, faculty. Um, I'm a little unclear. No one can give me a core number. We have a certain number we pay, a certain number we don't pay, but are very actively involved in student and resident teaching. And then we have those involved in research. So as far as I can tell, we have about 350 people involved in this enterprise. When I started in 2012, I told Dean Clasco that we would need 250 people to complete this mission. I now realize that my number was wrong. We need 500. What does the size look like in the state of Florida? On the right side, in 2015, we were the eighth largest program in the South out of 100 in internal medicine. This year, we're seven out of 150, which is fantastic growth. And we've done it at relatively low cost in many ways. We've managed to invest in clinical and research areas and tried to maintain the personal and professional growth of the general and administrative staff, all of whom deserve our respect and appreciation. Without that group of individuals, without Jessica Burgess, Carolyn Dawson, Jennifer Newcomb, Joanne Tamayo, none of this could exist. So be sure to say thank you the next time you see a support person. In 2018, on an AAMC form, a medical student wrote, this wasn't about internal medicine, but about USF. Uh, this person stated that USF is not an elite medical school. Just a few months ago, a first year student told me how happy they were to be here. And it was an incredible school. And I had to agree with them. It is an incredible college of medicine. In that department, in that college of medicine, we are an elite department. Our teaching is ranked by the AAMC in the top 4%. I want you to think about that for a second. All the medical schools you've heard of, all that are named, all that you think of, all the Harvards, Stanford, Oregon, whatever, we're in the top 4%. In research, we have about $79 million in NIH grants. It's difficult to compute an exact figure, but it looks like to me the department will likely enter the top 30 programs in America, and I'm waiting the publication of the Blue Ridge report to confirm this. I think that would be a tremendous achievement since in 2013, we were 108. That kind of rise in ranking is unprecedented. And I have to thank our senior leadership, Dr. Lockwood, Dr. Mosley, Dr. Liggett and Rich Sobre for supporting our efforts to get research where it should be. Clinically, US News and World Report likewise recognizes our successes. Dr. Krischer's group is ranked 28th in the country. Gastroenterology is ranked number 26. Nephrology, pulmonary, and geriatrics are all high performing, but you have to realize that you can be 0.1% away separating number 26 and 27. We are very, very competitive 
in many of these departments. And I will show you other metrics that show you other successes as well. Because if you truly understand something, you can put a number on it. Next slide. This is a chance to look at the future. I want to call your attention over here to the lower right hand slide. And I had a realization as I kept getting asked for predictions about what COVID would do. And I kept asking when we would return to normal, which all I could do was laugh at in a gentle, nice way, but say, I wouldn't worry yourself about that. I decided that there was a new law of natural philosophy in modesty, I named it after myself. I call it Sinnott's Law. The more unpredictable the pandemic, the more we rely on predictions to figure out what to do next. I want you to take that to heart and think about the decisions we have to make each day related to this grievous pandemic we deal with. Secondly, I want you to look at a philosophic problem, actually an ethical problem, on the other side of the screen. Here, we talk about pay for value, but we need to talk about who's paying who for what value. And I think this is important. Doctors are the most respected group in America, and people need to know where we stand. To some people, Paying for value means better outcomes, decreased cost, and increase in population health. To others, it means the industry of pharmacy, uh, pharmacology, and technology, biotech, which actually produces value for patients. You thus end up with a pricing mechanism that's skewed because for most people, a cure is invaluable and they will pay whatever they can. It is up to society to figure this out, but they will need our guidance and our thought about this. I would like each of you to remember this slide. There's a lot in it and think about how this transition to paying for volume, to paying for value has changed as deaths from COVID exceed a million individual lives. Essentially, one out of 100 people over the age of 65 have died of COVID. But they don't die here. We do a great job. How does this strategic development work? To increase the faculty, you need to increase the budget. And it's like literally pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. We need to use our money with help, of course, from the dean and his team to build the de department and each division. As far as I can count, which I'm not great at, it looks like our budget is north of 136 million a year. That's a large budget. How do we do that? We've managed to do this with strategic planning. So when we go to the leadership team, we have a plan for how long something will take to do, what the return on investment will be, and how it will contribute to the mission of the College of Medicine. We communicate. We're trying our best to communicate with the community. We're also communicating within the department at a much better level. We're using virtual meetings. I know they're succeeding when I get complaints about too many Teams meetings. We're, as far as I know, one of the most aggressive departments at promoting our faculty. The dream years ago was that oh, we had to bring in an expert from outside. But you know who you work with, and you know that a lot of these people are every bit as expert 
as anybody from outside. So we aggressively promote from within and recognize achievements among our team of teams. I appreciate being involved myself in graduate medical education because in a way, that's what we're here for. We are a college of medicine and we're obliged to teach students and residents. We have a new departmental administrator, uh, Jessica Burgess. Uh, Jessica has an incredible mind for figures and a passion for accuracy. And that has been extraordinarily helpful. I myself have an open door policy, which all of you know. Anybody can come in anytime. Please wear a mask, which all of you do. But you know my door is open. You know also that my phone is on because I routinely get calls up until around 11 at night. You can call anytime. It's my job to answer. We've reorganized the departmental offices. We have a new emphasis with Dr. Gupta on faculty development. In other words, to steal a, an advertising phrase, buzz phrase, we want people to be all they can. When you look around, the people you work with are multi-talented. Someone may know everything there is to know about electrolytes, but they're also a wonderful musician and a great humanist. So we want to develop people both personally and professionally. Finally, we want transparency in operations. I want you all to know what we're doing as a team. We have a number of new initiatives. They're shown here. I could spend a week going through new initiatives. If we were to start at the bottom, EMS alone, four new fellowships, like I didn't have enough paperwork in my life. The Center for Advanced Lung Disease is getting accolades right and left. We now have a poison control program, a microbiome institute. We have JEDI, a global emerging disease institute. We have osteoporosis programs, a needle exchange program, a glomerulonephritis program. You can read all these. I encourage you to go back when you get a chance and look at this talk again and look at what some of these people have come up with. These are the results of human thought. These are not something someone tells you to do. These are acts of creation. This is simply a list of new faculty. I asked for a list. I got a list and said, and was told, <laughs> I had a, we think this is everybody. So if your name isn't on the list and you're new, tell me and I apologize for it. I take responsibility for it. I think the department has long been known for grace under pressure. When the going gets tough, you all get going. I know that you do it gracefully and as ladies and gentlemen, but you're also known for grit, a perseverance for long-term goals. Your ability to internalize the Dean's vision of an academic medical center and make it a reality. What's happened? Growth is outpacing resources. What do you expect? Look at the size of the faculty. Departmental size mandates much more management by division directors. I have 16 divisions. Uh, each one needs attention, but they need to be managed by the division and I will help wherever I can. Research the coin of the realm in our national rankings must be fully embraced by all divisions. And going forward, we're going to be ranking people based on research productivity. Finally, we want to define the role of telemedicine. And I have a reason for that. 
if I can operate a computer and talk to someone, anybody can. If I can operate a computer and treat someone and make them better, any of you all can. I think this is a very efficient way to deliver care. It takes a lot of the problems for patients, transportation, booking, et cetera, out of the occasion, out of the relationship and allows, of all things, I think in many times a closer patient relationship. Next. Now, where do we find success? Well, it's where preparation and opportunity meet, and we are well prepared. We have an army that's ready. We have to pay attention to outcomes. Now, one of the issues we face is that we have excellent outcomes, but we're not documenting well enough. I beg you, list all of the risk factors. It's so important. Our ranking will go up just by you typing in one more word. Recall the average patient admitted to Tampa General has 7.2 diagnoses and 12 risk factors. We need to do the same at Moffitt and the same at the Haley. Please document meticulously. We're going to tie teaching outcomes to metrics. And we've been doing that, especially with Dr. Oxner's help, very effectively. I want each person to teach the way they want to and get fulfillment from it. But I want them to do it well enough that the students recognize it or residents or trainees. One trick I use is that I tell people, I'm teaching you. And they're surprised to hear that. They get this odd look. I think they think it's just a natural relationship that we take our time and tell them things. Tell them you're teaching. We're going to look at research outcomes. If someone presented an idea to me, and this was forwarded up through the processes of the university, we need to know if that idea worked. Not that for any punitive reason, but just to make it better. And as I finish the talk, you'll see that. We're definitely looking at clinical outcomes. I have to praise General Medicine, Austin Follett, and Jamie Weber for some of their efforts in this regard that truly changed the culture. Finally, I want to talk about outbound met communications. We're unbelievably successful. We're no longer Tampa's best kept secret. It's important, and I'm going to address you further about this, about getting the word out about all we're doing. I love to walk into a lab or a patient's room and find us doing something new and different. But that's not enough for me to know. The community needs to know what they have for protecting them. The only way they're going to know it is by through the internet, the radio, the television, and if you're over 65, the newspaper. Our communication strategies involve branding, public relations, Ms. Jennifer Newcomb is going to work on a newsletter, and we're going to be more active on social media. Uh, I've been encouraged to get a TikTok channel. Uh, I'm working on that. I'm working on my dance moves. However, I do have a YouTube channel, uh, which has thousands of views. I found it very effective at communicating with the public. This is critical to our success. It boosts our reputation. It improves rankings. It engages alumni and donors. Engaging donors is critical right now. It strengthens our political impact when we deal with the legislature. So when our dean and president go to the legislature, they have something 
in their hand to show them. Finally, it gains national media reputation, which is reflected in best doctors and other publications of that nature. I've listed here the division accomplishments, which itself would form an entire encyclopedia. Dr. Locke has built up allergy and immunology with both patents and grants. Dr. Oliveira has taken off with cardiovascular sciences. I've asked him to let me interview some of the new applicants. He said, sure. Then he says, oh, John, I just added five more people. You should meet them someday. But that's good. He's picking great people. In diabetes, um, Dr. Krischer is the number one recipient of NIH grants in the nation. Now, occasionally you'll hear people say, well, you know, a lot of our research is Dr. Krischer. And I would agree. A lot of it is. This man is a genius, and he has an approach to diabetes that will likely result in a cure or a Nobel Prize. Now, what you have to realize is that if you go to the Blue Ridge Report, you'll see that every medical school has a long ball hitter like Dr. Krischer. You'll see it in the top 10 one at the University of California, San Francisco, one at Duke, one at Mass General, one at the University of Chicago. You don't see two, three, or four at any single school. These people are precious and they're spread out. So don't be misled by the fact that, quote, oh, the research is just Dr. Krischer. That is a grievous misstatement of fact. You should counter that. In digestive diseases and nutrition, telehealth had over 10,000 clinic visits and a national ranking of 26. Emergency medicine is actively participating under David Orban in a needle exchange program. General medicine is involved in COVID trials uh, service to the community, and a fascinating area of desensitizing people that are allergic to the vaccine. Some of our most exciting research is being done by Dr. Vishweshwar in hematology, who is using adenovirus vectors to insert the gene for hemophilia A and hemophilia B into patients so that their hemophilia is partially cured. There are only eight centers in the United States and probably 14 in the world that are doing this type of research. This is extraordinarily exotic. It's absolutely fascinating and it's very important. Yes. For hospice and palliative care, We've realized their value as people, unfortunately, did not do as well as we'd hoped with COVID. And they've worked very much with the internal medicine residency to incorporate palliative care as part of medicine. We all, and I know you, all of us share traits of empathy and sympathy, but we can get overwhelmed and we lose track of what Lincoln would call the better angels of our nature. Amanda Wilson helps ground us again and bring back, brings back the idea that a doctor often can't save a life, but they can reduce suffering. That's a critical concept. In infectious diseases, they've done so much with COVID I'm just going to have a separate website, and you can go there and figure that out. In nephrology, they did get their own hospital, which I have to praise them for. Nephrology and hypertension has expanded outpatient dialysis. A very strong division 
with excellent work. And Dr. Michelle with Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine has recruited eight new faculty, taken over the CTICU, and in her spare time, Dr. Harazo Mayo raised $6 million in philanthropic money. Rheumatology with Dr. Carter has expanded clinical research, has a fantastic board rate, and produces great clinicians. Translational medicine had more than 20 research papers and 10 funded programs. Seven new inventions in the past year. Three licensed by a new USF spin out and another a rapid COVID diagnostic breath test. Finally, Dr. Moapatra is part of the group, the VA group using SHIELD. SHIELD is a new national program to help us contain future pandemics. Because right now, we have never, ever been more at risk for a second pandemic. For faculty development, I talked about bringing people up from within. I found that there are so many choices, it becomes difficult. Dr. Elamine is now the chief of staff at Bay Pines. We're building more affiliations with them. Dr. Kim is vice chair of research. Dr. Lakshmi uh, has been the director of the Global Emerging Disease Institute. Uh, she's found that um, management might be a lot harder than clinical medicine. Dr. Kaylee Tash has been appointed director of infectious diseases at the Bay Pines Hospital at VA. Dr. Van Nostrand, the program director in pulmonary. And one of our own graduates, Dr. Whitaker, is now the deputy chief of staff at the VA. For promotion and tenure, our success is shown below. It's unbeatable. Next slide. For notable recognition, uh, I happen to know that I can say about 120 words a minute. An average physician can read 500 words a minute. So I encourage you to read this slide and see what these people have done from Dr. Restrepo being appointed to the Delphi Pan America Project, to Dr. Kim editing the Sanford Guide, to Dr. Lazama becoming a laureate in the American College of Physicians. A success story that really makes me burst with pride. This building careers, I think, is very much my, my role. Next. For patient-centered teaching, I, can, I can't say it often enough, top 4%. That feels so nice when I meet with other chairs and I tell them that, and I watch the look on their face wondering, what is he doing? And I think to myself, I'm really not doing much. I leave it up to Lazama and Aller to figure this out and make sure we have the best teaching program in the state. I want to call attention at the bottom to scholarly concentrations, which add a second realm of learning and a second realm of opportunities for our students. Next slide. For patient-centered teaching in graduate medical education, we're increasing the number of residents, we're increasing the number of fellows, we're increasing the number of chief residents and patient safety residents. Our step two averages have climbed even as we have increased the numbers. I think what this tells us, if you look at the truth behind these facts, is one thing limiting our growth is that we're not fully an academic medical center. We need more faculty to achieve the goals, our shared goal of more and better teaching. Next. For patient-centered teaching, 
the idea here, resident abstracts, despite extra call, unbelievable clinical responsibilities, residents put out 56 abstracts and 64 publications last year. I don't know any program in the country that could do that in the middle of a pandemic. Think, each day you risk your life seeing patients, and then you go home and conduct research and write about it. I am so proud of you for this. Thank you. In the residency curriculum, you can read all the restructuring from the telemedicine COVID program, the inpatient rotations, and a list of new fellowships, which is larger than we could fit on the page. Next. In wellness, uh, Dr. Lazama has put together an, an annual wellness grand rounds lecture, which I found very useful. And I think the grand rounds I've rewatched the most. Secondly, he has the VA wellness lecture series. Dr. Lazama cares deeply and personally about each of our trainees. And he and Kelly Allo know them by name. I think that's tremendous. It shows for to care about a program, you have to care more about the people in it. If you look at it from an odd business point of view, our talent walks in and out of the doors each morning. It's the people. For professional development, Dr. Shanu Gupta has brought in Dr. Sanjay Saint and is working on building academic CVs and working on faculty development. Also, we have continued programs for the residents that are expanding. The Haley VA has likewise grown. We were fortunate for six years to have a a good friend of mine who often kid, kidded about being from Alabama, I would go to his office and shut the door, would revert to our Southern accents and start talking about the way things should be the way they were in Alabama. But he certainly brought a breath of life to support <laughs> Jeff. And as a member of the senior executive service held as a dis distinguished position, we miss him. Alameen has been advanced to chief of staff at Bay Pines. I have to praise him for being approachable, helpful, and totally committed to our academic programs, a true asset. The VA itself is number one in the nation for telemedicine. It's, number, it's the second busiest VA for inpatient visits. For research, we've gone from 38 to better than 30. Sponsored research projects have gone from 25 to 186. I enjoy getting these printouts because of my vision. I don't see screens well. And I love, I see these forms with Dr. Kim's. It looks like Dr. Kim did everything. But then I turn a page, I see other people are working just as hard. We've gone from five to 12 NIH grants that are awarded to USF, not passed throughs. We have 287 published papers. And just think, 31 patents awarded or applied for. Just this year, we submitted 67 proposals for federal funding. These were submitted by you, not by me. They represented your thoughts, your creativity, your ideas. Next slide. For patient-centered care, I think we know how good we are clinically. Each one of you know in your heart that there are very few doctors better than you are. And I agree with that. I am honored to work 
with the best clinicians I know. I would not go anywhere else for care than care by you all. If you look at best doctors in America, how that's expanded, and that's done by vote. So these are voted on by people outside of USF. This reflects very well on our progress being recognized clinically. I can't get through a talk, obviously, without talking about COVID. Um, I need to recognize Terry Ashmead, Dr. Ashmead, the chief quality officer. And I was sort of confused about chief quality officer until I saw the energy and effort that she put in with Asa Oxner to making our clinic the best possible clinic. To switch gears a little bit to Tampa General, the first COVID hospital was essentially a hospice on Staten Island to isolate patients in New York. The second COVID hospital here, the creation of President Corus and Dean Lockwood, is the second COVID hospital in the nation. Two or three times a week, I speak to physicians about COVID outside the country. Physicians in Brazil, Hong Kong, India, Europe, Everyone knows about JEDI. Everyone wants our protocols. Everyone wants to know how we do it. If you were admitted to JEDI, your mortality would be 40% lower than another hospital. We're in the top 2% in the nation for length of stay. When I look at the few hospitals ahead of us, one of them was a hospital in Idaho that discharge six patients. So we are in the top 2%. In my heart, we're in the top 1%. We have over 80 COVID-19 clinical trials going on right now, many of them under Dr. Kim, Dr. Ashmead, and Dr. Oxner. And <clears throat> when I talked about understanding something, you need to realize that this team delivered over 60,000 vaccines. We conducted over 310,000 COVID tests. We infused more than 4,000 patients with monoclonal antibodies. And we admitted more than 5,600 patients. And that was in November. If you haven't visited this institute, I encourage you to come down please get me. Uh, Dr. Lakshman will tell you she's busy, which she pretends to be, but maybe she is. But come down, let us show you what we have. Next. Now, looking to the future, and as I pointed out with Senate's law, that's a bit risky, but I will begin with one of the definitions of insanity, and that's doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. It was time for a radical change. And here, President Corus and Dean Lockwood realized the need for an academic medical center for the west coast of Florida. It required an unbelievable amount of work. This is, I don't a mixture of medicine, law, culture, imagination, property, etc., being integrated between academicians and hospital systems. We want to make sure that we support them in this mission 100%. The end result will be a beautiful product that each of you will be proud to tell future generations about your role in making this such an institution. My prescription for the future, 
is, I think, going to be quite accurate. We're going to be working in a transformed world. Nothing is going to be the same. They're going to change everything from prescribing laws to insurance issues. It's going to be a time of stress. It will bring much more change than continuity. And as Marcus Aurelius, the Roman general turned philosopher said, change is the nature of life. And change will be the nature of our lives for the next five to eight years. We intend to continue our diversity initiative. We want to try to understand the demographics of discord. Like, why are people not getting vaccinated? We want to understand why people think the wrong medicines might work. We want to recognize that new players are going to arrive in the town. This is an affluent community, and I would not be surprised at all to see Cleveland Clinic decide they want a clinic here. I think they would find it have more than they bargained for here, and then they can return to Cleveland or wherever else they want to go. We want to, as a team, combat the disparities of care. This is an immensely troubling issue for me personally, and I think for each of us. The idea that there might be a dis disparity of care is a disgusting concept. We need to transform the way people think. We need to make sure that everyone gets the same care. I'm actually comfortable that this is the case. It's never come across my desk, and I've never seen it. But we want to guard against it in a world where they're trying to make medicine a commodity. We want to positively educate with Tampa General and H. Lee Moffitt. And I would call this what a, an ambassador would call it. I'd call it power sharing in a multipolar world. We're going to be answering to Dr. Hewitt Moffitt, President Corus at Tampa General, and Dean Lockwood. I think with that group, if we can make it work, and it's going to come down to us, it's not the bosses deciding what they're going to do. It's us deciding if we're going to cooperate and make it work. We need to do that. I want to quote Vince Lombardi. One of his lines was, if we chase perfection, we can catch excellence. I want you to keep that in mind. What about you as a physician? I'm often asked about work-life balance, and I want to tell you I'm an expert on it. I work 17 hours a day, and the rest of the time I call people on the phone late at night and ask what's happening. The ideal work-life balance. I know that's not the balance many of you seek. I think as you look at balance, I think it's important to embrace the idea of change. Again, to quote the Roman philosophers, when things happen, it's not the thing itself, but our feelings about it that bother us. So examine why do you feel that way? Why are you upset? Oftentimes the event we have no control over. An example would be a hurricane wipes out Tampa General, and then they fire the board. That doesn't make any sense. The board had nothing to do with the hurricane. So you need to put thought into what we're doing and how we react to it. Try to make it positive. Be open, be listen, and be listening. We want to share physician and management leadership. If you see an opening where you can have a voice, put your foot in the door, then put the rest of yourself in the door, then take charge. We want to manage the future of remote work. If we don't decide how it's done, other people will decide for us. I know how my office works best. 
I know who works best at home. I know who I need to have here, but each of you do too. This will be a situation where you're, if we don't lead, we'll be led, and you may not like the way you're led. I want to bring about an idea. I know that if I brought up the word reflection or yoga or abstracting yourself and thinking about things, people would be curious. I, I want to ask a special favor of each of you. I would like you to take a minute maybe two, maybe three. I want you to think about the idea of what it means to change a culture. I can make people show up to clinic, but I can't make them be happy. I can make someone work harder, but I can't make them work better. These are all internal aspects of our lives. I'd like you to think as this academic medical center concept evolves, what am I doing that makes me part of the problem? What am I doing that makes me part of the solution? What more could I do to be part of the solution. It's so interesting that some people come to me and I can predict who they are and they bring me problems. And I try to guide them, mentor them and say, bring me solutions. Yet another group of people come in with solutions. And that idea, any idea can only be arrived at if you sit down and use introspection, you are some of the smartest people in the country. It is your life. And how often have you thought about whether you're part of the problem or part of the solution and what can you do to make it better? So please try that. We had several of the residents that rotated through JEDI write a reflection on what they did. One composed music, one drew a painting, one several wrote beautiful expository statements. These are the winners of pandemic reflections. These are the people that took their hearts and their souls and put them on a piece of paper or a note of music. It's things they own, they should be proud of. We have arranged for these to be framed and posted in the lobby of JEDI for future generations of physicians to see. The second group are a group of residents who went out of their way to publish something about COVID. These individuals did this despite brutal schedules, exposure to dangerous diseases, a number of these people themselves caught COVID. What did they do? They still had time to write a paper about it. These two will be recognized in the lobby of JEDI. What a wonderful success story. Thank you. As we conclude, I want to quote Ari DeJayas and over here under Rocky, he had a great point and a quote that Jim Lewis taught me. He said that the ability to learn faster than your competitors is the only sustainable competitive advantage. The ability to learn faster than your competitors may be the only sustainable competitive advantage. I myself have become a learning machine about COVID. Each of you should work on learning faster. 
We want to become a learning organization. Envision us as an organism in a threatening environment. If we wait too long to get it perfect, you're going to be somebody else's lunch, and they'll be telling you how to get it perfect. So do a first iteration. Learn from it. If it doesn't work, do a second iteration. Change the variables. Learn from that. Do a third iteration, and that will bring us progress. I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for the commitment to humanity that each of you show. You have my ultimate respect. I'm proud to be associated with such a remarkable department and so many remarkable human beings. You are people I truly respect and I'm truly proud of. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sinn, for that excellent talk. Uh, we'll take a couple minutes if others would, uh, would like to make some comments or ask some questions. Uh, we'll take a couple minutes, um, so please uh, come forward if so. As we check out some pictures from Dr. Sinnott's uh, first nine plus years here. As you see with residents and, and faculty and uh, some uh, who we've lost, um, who are uh, past heroes of our department. This is very touching. Thank you, Joe. My pleasure. Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, mm -hmm. re really appreciate uh, the attendance and thanks, John, again for your leadership in the department. And we are so excited for everything coming up this year. And uh, congratulations as uh, you are in this 10th year of being chair. And thank you for your leadership during COVID and your talk has given us a lot to think about and a lot to be excited about and a lot to strive and starting to work on that first iteration as you have charged us, we will all do tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all, y'all have a great day.